and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Good afternoon. It's just gone at three o'clock. I'm Simon Pusey in the GB newsroom. Ukrainian officials have urged civilians in the eastern Luhansk region to flee as Russia is amassing new forces. The governor there warned that Russia is preparing a new offence as shelling increases in recent days. Ukraine has increasingly been warning that Russia plans intensified attacks in the country's east and south after withdrawing its troops from areas to the north of the capital, Kiev. President Zelensky said the country was preparing for a tough battle ahead. Russian forces are being gathered in the east and south. A large amount of forces, equipment and armed people who are preparing to occupy yet another part of our territory. This will be a tough battle. We believe in this fight and our victory. We are ready to simultaneously fight and to look for a diplomatic solution that can put an end to this war. Meanwhile, the latest British military intelligence shows that Vladimir Putin's forces continue to hit Ukrainian non-combatants such as civilians. It follows a Russian rocket strike on a train station in Kramatorsk in eastern Ukraine, which killed at least 52 people, including five children and injured more than 100. The Ministry of Defense says Russia's ambitions to establish a land corridor between Crimea and the Donbass continue to be thwarted by Ukrainian resistance. Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Tom Tugendhat, told GB News President Putin can't can't say Russia is at war with NATO. At the moment, it's very hard for him to make that claim because it blatantly isn't. What it blatantly is, is the Ukrainian people defending themselves, yes, with weapons and ammunition that come from Poland or the Czech Republic or the UK or Sweden or various other places. Sweden, of course, importantly, not a NATO country. Um, but it's not NATO against Russia. It's Putin against the Ukrainian people. And I think that is an important distinction. Labour says the Chancellor and his family have potentially saved tens of millions of pounds in taxes due to his wife's non-domicile status. The Chancellor's wife, Akshata Murthy, has said she will now pay UK tax on all her worldwide income despite the status exempting her from doing so. It's as Rishi Sunak admitted to holding a US green card while in office. He said it was returned after he sought guidance and that he followed all laws and paid taxes in full. The royal family has released a poetic tribute to mark the first anniversary of the Duke of Edinburgh's death. The poem written by the poet laureate Simon Armitage is called The Patriarchs and Elegy. He died on this day last year at Windsor Castle, just months short of his 100th birthday. Husbands to duty, they unrolled their plans across billiard tables and vehicle bonnets, regrouped at breakfast. What their secrets were was everyone's guess and nobody's business. Great grandfathers from birth, in time they became both inner core and outer case in a family heirloom of nesting dolls. Simon Armitage there remembering Prince Philip. The first all-private astronaut team has docked with the International Space Station in a historic mission. This NASA footage shows the SpaceX rocket ship arriving a short time ago. The three passengers, one former NASA astronaut and three paying customers, are visiting the station 250 miles above Earth for eight days of science and biomedical research. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll have more news at the top of the next hour.
Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking bright for many, with the majority of the showers fading away. Let's take a look at the details. Zooming into the southwest of England, and it will be a fine end to the day here with plenty of sunshine. It will quickly begin to feel chilly, though, once the sun begins to set. Moving eastwards, and there could be one or two showers around first thing this evening, but these will quickly ease away, leaving clear skies. Across then into Wales, and any showers will fade away, with most of the cloud also melting away, leaving a clear but chilly evening. Any showers across the Midlands will tend to become confined to northern and eastern parts, with skies largely clear elsewhere. Once the sun sets, skies will clear further, giving a cold night for all. After an afternoon of sunshine and showers, northern England will see a dry evening with skies turning increasingly clear. Just like elsewhere, it will be a chilly end to the day with a frost forming. Moving into Scotland and the showers will continue across some northern and eastern areas with these wintry across the higher ground. Elsewhere, there will be some late sunshine to end the day. And Northern Ireland will also see some late sunshine and apart from the odd, very isolated shower, it will be a dry end to the day for most. Overnight, most will be dry and clear, leading to a cold night with widespread frost developing, especially in the countryside. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight and into tomorrow morning. The GB News Tavern is open. Drinks have been poured. But before I introduce my guest to you this evening, who's been a very successful rock and roll singer, an actress, presented radio shows, uh, goodness knows what else she's done. But let's have a look at her. On Top of the Pops, the song is Can the Can, and it's 1973. Yes, I'm joined by Susie Quattro on Talking Pints. Susie, great stuff. Cheers to you. Very, very <laughs> nice to see you. Champagne. So they, they did. They, when they said, "What would you like?" I told them that I didn't think I'd actually get it. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. No expense spared for you. Absolutely. Looking at that clip of you in 1973, to get up on stage and do that, you must have had just bags of self-confidence and belief. You do have to have. Self-belief, I believe in that. What I had was, what worked in my favor, was I knew that I wasn't like anybody else. So I couldn't find a niche in which to fit since I was a little girl. So what happens is you find your own niche, which is what I did. Yeah, and so Detroit, an upbringing in Detroit, musical family, uh, and you're out, you know, playing in, playing in bands and singing, and you get talent spotted and taken away from the American Midwest to the United Kingdom. Tell us about that. Um, I was in bands from the age of 14, started playing bass. And I am a schooled drummer and classical pianist, by the way, but started playing bass at 14. We went on the road right away. Pleasure Seekers, all-girl band, 64, all the way up to 1971. Mickey Most came to Detroit to record Jeff Beck at Motown, came to see the band, and offered me a solo contract. And it was the se second time in one week that I'd been offered a solo contract. So that's the, the one telling you it's time to go. Yeah, yeah, and Mickey Most, of course, was a very, very well-known talent spotter in those days. Yes. So it's kind of been, I mean, much of your life since 1971, when you arrived here, much of your life has been on this side of the pond. Yes, it's so strange, but I always, <laughs> I'm always the American in England. Nobody ever thinks I'm English. Okay. Ever, ever, ever. But I have, this is the longest I've ever lived anywhere. So I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, and I do like England. It took me a while to get used to it. But it didn't take you very long to hit big success, did it? Because you come in 71, and we're watching you there in 1973, and there's a whole string of hits, you know, right throughout that period of the 1970s. Well, once it started, it started. Yeah. You know, and then you, you have, I had my nine-year apprenticeship in bands and touring everywhere and every gig God invented. Um, and then in 73, I was just about 23, had my first number one, and then that started me on the 
it's now, I've been in the business 58 years now. Mm. And it's unbelievable. And you've sold 55 million records. Yes. You've been it's, very, you've been very, very successful. You've made money. You've done well. But so many people, so many people like you, who suddenly hit this incredible, I mean, the level, the level of fame you had when you were doing that on top of the pops. I mean, you were this, you became this big sex symbol. I mean, you did. Is that, <laughs> well, it's true, isn't it? You know, it's true. I, I blush. You know, but you know, it's true. You did, yeah. and a huge level of fame uh, that you achieved. So many other people who went down that route, very talented yep. singers, musicians, sure, sure. went down that route and, and spiralled into self-destruction, many of them dying incredibly young. Mm -hmm. Did you manage to avoid the excesses or are you just a great survivor? No, I've avoided them. Um, my father instilled in me my work ethic. Mm -hmm. He is, and he was, he's been gone for a while now, um, a musician. And when I was like 16... Here's the answer to your question. Yeah. He, all, although all his kids were in the business, he pulled me aside at home. And he said, I want to talk to you. I said, yeah. He said, looks like you're serious about what you're doing. He knew I was going to be in it for my lifetime. I said, I am. He said, okay, I have something to tell you. I said, yes. He said, what you're doing is a profession. It's your job. And I went, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, so if you're playing for 10 people or 10,000, Every single person in that audience has taken money out of their pocket and paid to see you, and you owe them. And that's my attitude. Mm. So I never felt the need to do excess, you know, I just... No, because I, but, but, so, but, but how do you deal with that level of fame? Because it did come very quickly, didn't it? Uh, you deal with it by never for a moment thinking that because you're successful in your chosen field, that it makes you better than somebody else. Mm. It doesn't. Mm. And I'm very lucky I have an ego room at home. <laughs> <laughs> go on, tell us more. You, go, you have to go up two flights of stairs. It's an Elizabethan manor house. I know it's great, isn't it? And on the third floor, you can bang your head in the walls are crooked, so it's an allergy, but it's real. And you finally get to a big, heavy wooden door, and I had a little plaque made, and the plaque says, ego room, Mind your head. <laughs> you go in, and it's everything. Videos, scrapbooks, clothes, guitars, posters everywhere, stage passes. And you, you actually see the big red book, This Is Your Life. The important Yeah, thing because is, you did that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. The important thing is, though, you come out of the room, and you shut the door. <laughs> this is how I stay normal. There's a place for the ego, yeah. and there's a place to put it away. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Because, you know, Elizabethan Manor House in rural England, it's a long way from Detroit, isn't it? In, it, in, in every sense. It's, it's, I can't believe that I'm living in a, an Elizabethan Manor House and I come from Detroit. I mean, how more different can you be? And what are the locals like? Are people, uh, are people friendly you know, to you? I, I, mean, I, how do you? I mean, how do you find the English? I, I obviously, because I've been around so long now, I get recognized everywhere. And <laughs> I always do the same because I refuse to hide. From the time I got known, I refused to hide. I said, if you want to see me, here I am. So I'll walk down the street in town, and somebody will go. And I'll look at them, and I'll go. <laughs> that's, that's the end of the confrontation. <laughs> but they recognize me with my mask on. How is that possible? Mm. Well, I guess because of television and Top of the Pops and but, all the other but, things that you've done. Even with the mask on. Even with the... Even with the mask. I've, I found the mask a blessing, personally, because <laughs> having been in politics, it's a 50-50 reaction I'm going to get. So I, think, I think the plastic surgeons are a bit out of pocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're probably you don't right. Need the, don't need the, the operation but, anymore. But the singing, the music, and, we'll, and, and you're still doing it, and we're going to come to that in a moment. But the other bit of your career uh, that really is fascinating and, you know, kind of made you... Well, not just big in this country, but America, the whole of the English-speaking world. That incredible series, Happy Days. And it was just, you know, when I was a teenager, it was just cult stuff. And people loved it. And they'd organised their life around what time it was going to be on. How did that happen? How do you go from being this rock and roller to being an actress? I always knew I could do that. Um, I am an artiste. Okay. I'm an artist. Yeah. I'm an author. I'm a presenter on TV, on radio. I act. I've done musicals. I've written a musical. I'm an artiste. I like to stretch. Don't box me in. Don't box me in. Uh, they, they called me. I was on tour in Japan. And they had the script. For a long time, 
they were trying to find somebody who could act, somebody who was tough and vulnerable at the same time, and possibly could sing. Hello. And there you were. <laughs> there I was. <laughs> but it was such a, and it was called Happy Days, but it actually was a very, very joyful, happy program. Must have been fun to do. It was great fun to do, and I made some good friends on that. I'm still in pretty much constant email with uh, Henry and Ron, and we go back and forth, and they've always supported me, giving me quotes from my books. And yep. In fact, in my documentary that was released at the end of 2019, Susie Q, yep. um, Henry's quote at the end was my favorite. He just touched my heart, you know. But it was a great show to do, and in fact, Ronnie said to me, because I we were talking, and I said, did I ever feel like a new actress to you or new to the show? And he said, no. You felt like you'd acted all your life and you felt like you'd always been in the show. Mm. So it was one of those things that was faded, faded to be and it felt natural and correct. Now, all those years you were at Radio 2 and you were presenting and you were looking at music and new music. Am I right in thinking that the music scene in the UK is really very, very strong still? It's very... Strong. Uh, what do you mean? Vibrant, strong, we're doing yeah, well. Yeah, sure. I, mean, I mean, I go to America, the records I hear in the car in America, I hear more English, British uh, songs. Oh, you want, me to, you want me to praise the British and... Well, I'm just, I'm just trying um, to... I, I mean, it, 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 it just it strikes me that America culturally leads us in terms of film and many other things. Other. We need each other. You need each other. Yeah. Um, the British are more prone to accepting something brand new. Mm-hmm. They'll give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when I first started to go back to America when I was touring, like in early 74, with my English band with hits under my belt, I turned on the radio and all I heard was Linda Rodstad or the Eagles. Right. They get kind of stuck in a time warp. <laughs> but you do feed off each other. Yeah. American feeds off Britain and Britain yeah. feeds off America. The countries are incredibly close, aren't oh, they? Oh, yeah. Culturally. Yeah, well, what is it Winston Churchill said? Two countries divided by a common language. Yeah, I and I can tell you that's exactly correct. <laughs> <laughs> but Susie, far from um, even contemplating anything as dull, um, as boring, as mundane as retirement, you're getting ready for another big concert. So tell us all about it. Big one, big one, big one. April the 20th, I'm playing the Royal Albert Hall, my solo show, two hours with an interval. I've been doing this show for about five or six years now. Yep. And it's my favorite kind of thing because I can take you through my life. Nobody says, oh, you're on and off. The... I can do what I want. That's it. They've paid their money. They've come to Fantastic. see you. Fantastic. And I've worked out my intro. Ready? Come on. Share okay. it. The queen of rock and roll is playing the Royal Albert Hall. And I'm going to turn this into this. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that allowed to say? I well, I think it's all right, you know. I mean, yeah, the, well, the queen of rock and roll, which you have been called many, many times. Yeah. It, uh, I, well, I wish you really well with this concert on the 20th of April. Um, I have to say, you know, just huge congratulations, really. Thank you. What's been the best bit? The best bit? That's so hard to say. I've had so many highlights. You know what the thing I'm most proud of? is that I've been able to be successful for so many years and basically feet on the ground. That to me is a real accomplishment. It is a real I'm approachable, yeah. I'm normal-ish. Yeah. Um, yeah. I said it to well, not, well, well, yeah. well, my, my friend in Sydney Paul, bless her, we had lunch one time and we were talking and I said, I'm normal, Lindsay, and she went, <laughs> that's my memory of her. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think if you've got creative talent, you're necessarily normal. No, you're never going to be normal. I think you're perhaps exceptional. But but the feet on the ground point is a very, very good one. And and that's perhaps why you have, you know, kept going forever. Not, as I said, self-destructed as so many other people in rock and roll. I take it serious. Seem to do. No, you do take yeah. it serious. When I get on that stage, I'm going to entertain you. No, and you if you really don't go out happy, that's not your fault, that's my fault. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that on the 20th of April at the Royal <laughs> Albert Hall, people will go out very, very happy. Last question. When you listen to music, what do you most like to listen to? <laughs> people ask me this, it's so crazy. Because <laughs> I do rock and roll for a living, yeah. and I'm always writing it, I'm, you know, rock and roll is everything, I tend to go opposite. I do Frank Sinatra, I do Gene Pitney, I do... Bob Dylan, I do uh, Tom Petty, I do Dory Previn, I do um, just everybody but rock and roll. Because it's, <laughs> it's my relaxation. Now. It's your time off. Yeah. 
I get that. And having worked as hard as you have, you no doubt deserve it. Susie Quattro, thank Cheers. you for joining me on Talking Pints. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>well, Colin, you couldn't get a nicer introduction than that, could you? A welcome to Talking Pints. Yes. Very good Hi. to see you here. These, uh, these people, these, I guess, monsters, in a way, uh, that you've spent so much of your working life tracking down, um, 
Do you, I mean, I don't know, I, I, how do you, do you try and put yourself in their mind or is that impossible with people like this? I think you do to a degree. I think, you know, I always say detective work's about people. It's about understanding people. And so it's about understanding how people think, react, what will they likely have done in that situation. And if you're chasing somebody like Belfield or, or Grant, who, who is a monster, then I guess you have to put yourself in, in that frame of mind yeah. to a degree. Must um, be quite hard to do. Yeah, it is. Um, it is to a degree, but you need to remember that aside from what they're actually doing, they're normal people. And so they... That's quite a difficult they thing. Go to there sort of, as, I, I, yeah, I, but they go there. Yeah. How does one balance that out? But they go there as normal people. They leave there as normal people. They do something very abnormal in the middle. So when you're looking at trying to work out how to find out who that person is, you still need to kind of understand. They will travel on the bus. They will use their mobile phone. They will walk past CCTV cameras, the same as you They'll and I They'll go for a pint, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly that. So, I get it. You know, so it's a kind of mixture of that. And... and in some ways, while you're doing it, you have to divorce yourself from the idea of, of the horror of what they are actually doing. Mm. Because I think that, could be, that can be counterproductive to, to, to thinking clearly and thinking straight. Did you always want to be a cop? Yeah, more or less. Um, yeah, my father was a cop. Um, uh, and uh, I, I kind of... I was a bit embarrassed about it, actually. I was a bit embarrassed to say so, I think. Um, but uh, by the time I'd got to about 14 or 15, I'd pretty much decided. But I, I went, to, went to go and read law from, from school to university and, and uh, hated being away from London and uh, applied to join the Met. So the, it was always going to be the Met for you? There was no question yeah, I'm about a Londoner. that? Yeah, I'm a Londoner, so, so I joined the Met, you know. Uh, what are the, you know, we see... I mean, they say you're getting older when the police look young, but, you know, we see police officers out there. Hmm. Um, uh, what is it? What are the characteristics of people who've qualified as police officers, what are the characteristics that mark them out as detectives? I, I think to serve as a police officer full stop in whatever role, you need to have this idea of service to your community. Yes. Um, you know, and, and, and there are lots and lots of brave young women, men and women who, who, who do that all over the country, thankfully. Uh, to be a good detective, you need to, to, to have a, a degree of understanding of human nature, uh, a bit of patience, a bit of an eye for detail, I suppose. But, you know, the, there's room... One of the great things about leading a, a largest team, as I did, investigating murders, is you've got all sorts of people on there. And part of the trick is finding out who's good at what and using them to their best... Isn't that, doesn't that apply for everything in life, I think? Uh, yeah. yeah. Find I, what people are good at, yeah. Yeah. I lead, I, I, people have said to me, what's leadership? And I say, well, well leadership is about uh, attaining your ambition by getting the best out of the people that you lead. So a case like the Levi Belfield case, I mean, how many people would have worked on that investigation? Uh, initially, I had a team of 70 or 80. Did you? Um, and and that's, so that's about twice the size of a, a normal murder squad at the time in London. Um, and some of those fell away as, as we got through it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, th there was, it was taken very seriously, rightly so, by, by the Metropolitan yeah. Police at that time. And so I, I was given resources from, you know, places of the Met I didn't know existed sort of thing. And a case like that, a very, very, you know, clearly horrendous series of murders that are taking place. What sort of... I mean, you've got human resources. Mm. But, I mean, I, I read that, you know, there was a white van that seemed to be at the centre of all mm. of this. Mm. Um, a white van that was spotted in a certain part... Um, a certain part of town. And similarly, uh, with the other big case, I mean, this, this serial rapist, Delroy... I mean, I, I, unbelievable what went on there for year, over 100 victims, yes. apparently. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, so if you're chasing a van, you're... Tra you know, I mean, I guess the computer has made tracking things down a bit easier, has it? It's made... Yeah, I mean, the computer's made recording what you're doing and making sure that you're working efficiently easier. Uh, the big thing that, that's helped in, in, in recent years has been CCTV, has been everybody's obsession with their mobile phone and therefore leaving yeah. a trail of wherever they are, you know, and, and that's very much at the basis of, 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 of most serious investigations now. And, of course, we've had DNA in the last 30 years or just under that, you know, uh, gives and takes. It's, it's great for proving things, but if you've got DNA with no name on the end of it, like they had in the Night Stalker case, I think it can be a hindrance. And I think there's, there's been a degree of seduction of police and detectives with DNA, which has led to a bit of de-skilling, really. If there's no DNA, then okay. do they know what to do now? 
you know. You see, I'm struck, Colin, by something. You know, you talk about DNA and the huge advances that that can, in the right circumstances, give. I think I'm right in saying that we are certainly in the European time zone, we are the most surveilled, we are the most photographed, yeah. whether it's walking down the street or driving on a so-called smart motorway, which appears to be you being photographed constantly. Um, we're not any safer, are we? I think we are to a degree. I Do mean, you really? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm firmly in the camp that if you've, if you've done nothing wrong, there's nothing to be frightened of these things about. One, um, but I think that it enables it enables um, scarce resources to be diverted more quickly than they would otherwise be to things that need their attention, and I think that's you know that's come to the fore recently since since you know the police have lost so many members of staff over the last sort of uh, ten years. Or so, so is that why they won't visit your house if you've been burgled? Uh, I think they won't visit your house within burgled because they're spread so thinly, and if you know, look. Policing takes place within the whole community, and it's not just policing that's been hit with, with, with lack of funding and lack of resourcing. Um, the best thing you could do to make policing proper policing, as some people might see it, would be to put more money into mental health services. For so much time of the response policing is taken up dealing with people in mental health crisis, and there is nobody else. And because people who do the job in the police service care, they won't just say it's nothing to do with us, they will try and help. Uh, but, you know, you're waiting at home because, God forbid, your house has been burgled or your car's mm. been broken mm. into, and the officers that would come and do that are sitting at a hospital waiting for somebody to assess someone who's had a mental health crisis. So the police still care, is that what you're saying? Because many, the, many out there think the police don't care anymore. Mm. Oh, they do. I, I, they, they do, and there's nothing these, these brave young women would like to do more than to police and do the job that they think they signed on for. So you can reassure me that Wayne Cousins is the exception? The oh, rare, rare exception. Yeah, he's a very, he's a very rare exception. Um, and yet, following that, mm. you know, with what we saw on Clapham Common mm. and some of the narrative in certain parts of the press, mm. it was almost being put... You know, we've also had WhatsApp conversations yes. going on at, you know, Charing Cross and other stations, mm. which were... Ah, extreme laddishness is one way you can put it. Um, no, they, they, worse they were than worse that, than that. Yeah. Fine. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, but... but but isn't there, I mean, when you're working mm. in a job that's dangerous, mm. in a job that at times you must go home and think, you know, I mean, this is just, I mean, this is so horrible what I'm doing. Yeah. Is it not possible that people, ex people display black humour of the most extraordinary kind in the way that soldiers perhaps do sometimes? I'm not excusing it, but I'm saying no. that all of these things have given an image. No, that, that, that's, I mean... You're right about black humour. There is a yeah. there is a, a vast difference between black humour yeah. and what Wayne Cousins was up to, what oh, the officers sure. at Charing Cross were up to on their sure. WhatsApp group, you know. Yeah. Um, and every single decent police officer, and there are thousands of them, yeah. pays the price for people like that who do things that are unacceptable. And there's no doubt they're unacceptable. And, you know, we're seeing now in the news reports more and more police officers who have been caught doing misogynistic yeah. sexual assault. You know, it's, it's virtually a daily yeah. thing. What I will say about that is we know they're there. The fact that it's getting into the newspaper shows that there is a will to tackle it and make sure that they are booted out. OK, now that's a fair point. Now that is a fair point. That is a fair point. Would you join the police force today, Colin? In a heartbeat. Would you? Yes. <laughs> you really would. So you've loved your career. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's... There are too many people in this world that have to spend 30 or 40 years doing a job they don't like. Yeah, yeah. And I got up virtually every day for 30 years looking forward to going to work. So what made you good at it? I was lucky. I had... That I, is delightfully uh, modest. Uh, I, had, <laughs> I like that. No, I was lucky enough to be with very good people, both in uniform and as a detective, and have teams that responded to the way... I wanted to work and, and we achieved things. So Martin Clunes mm. was picked to play DCI Sutton in Manhunt. Mm. And, and this, of course, was about both of these very high profile cases. Yeah. What happened? Did ITV come to you and say, we're going to, you know, we, we've decided to make you a star? Uh, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, 
I was doing some work for, for, for the, there's a screenwriter who's a wonderfully gifted chap called Ed Whitmore, and, and Ed was writing something else that never got made in the end, but he came to me through a friend of a friend to help him make that authentic. We became friends. He knew I was writing a book. I had started writing a book, and he insisted on reading what I'd written. He read and said, you've got to carry on with it, you've got to carry on with it. And somehow from that, he managed to, you know, I got a phone call from Buffalo, who the production company that made yep. it, saying, we'd like to talk to you about optioning your book you haven't written yet. And it, it was all done completely the wrong way yeah. around. And I realised I've been so fortunate with that because people who want to do things like that slave for years so tell me, to get it done. is Martin Clunes a good Colin Sutton? I think he's brilliant, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, I think he's, he's even better in the second season because he was a bit more light-hearted and, and I'm actually quite a light-hearted chap, I think. And, and, uh, but, yeah, he was, he was superb. What, 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 what really struck me was the, the skill that he had. He spent, I don't know, four or five, maximum of eight hours with me before he went in and did that. Mm -hmm. And I've got my family saying, Oh, he's got the way you speak. He's got your mannerisms. Yeah. He's got, you know. So that's that's that skill. That's a talented actor. So it really is. DCI Sutton, you've been immortalised. <laughs> well, yeah. You've left your mark on the world. That must feel quite good. Uh, yeah. There, there's 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 a there's a phrase in the police saying we did some good, and I'm happy that we did some good. I think you did. Thank you for joining me on Talking Pants. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. It's the best part of the day. Yes, the GB News Tavern has been declared open. I'm joined by Brad Moore, film actor and director, and he's joining me here on Talking Pints. And welcome to the programme. Cheers. Thank you very much for having me. Now, we saw this morning on pretty much every front page of our newspapers and acres and acres of print and large obituary columns, June Brown, better known as Doc Cotton, died aged 95 and... Here she is, and because this was the role, wasn't it? Dot Cotton in EastEnders, uh, which she kind of made her own. Um, and I just sort of was thinking to myself, I looked through the obituaries, Brad, and, you know, she'd been in Z Cars. She'd been in The Sweeney. She'd been in Doctor Who. She'd briefly been in Corrie. She'd acted with some of the great. She'd appeared in films. Dixon of Doc Grimm. Dixon of Doc Grimm. Oh, I forgot that one. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, unbelievable career. 
Um, she was 95. She was still on EastEnders in 2020. How many actresses or actors reached that level of prominence? Oh, she's a national treasure, isn't she? I mean, I think so. um, uh, we've got some great actors and actresses. Uh, she, she was wonderful. So, such a real person and so authentic on screen. Yeah. You know, and just, um, she directed theatre. I don't know if you spotted yeah. that. I was yeah. just reading about her a moment ago. I mean, what a life. Um, classically, fantastic. and a classically trained actor. Classically trained. Who could put on any voice. Turn her, uh, t turn her skills to anything, really. Yeah, and you know, um, it just struck me uh, in that old school vein, um, no reality TV, no quick turbo fame, you know, ha ha had to tread the boards yeah. and had to, you know, yeah. l learn, learn the ropes and, and learn her craft and come through that way. I mean, she's wonderful. Now, so a very, very different background uh, to you, Brad, uh, because kind of acting wasn't really your thing, was it? You know, kicked out of college and you then... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I was kicked out? No, go on. <laughs> break dancing. I would right. be, yeah, I would be practicing break dancing in the gym, and uh, the head uh, of the college kept catching me doing it. I was just desperately wanted to break dance, and I don't know if you know anything about break dancing. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's a very difficult thing to master. So I was obsessed with that, which I guess lets you into a little bit of my personality. And <laughs> I couldn't stop myself, keep going in the gym, and in the end, he said, "If you keep break dancing, you're out." And then one day I was out. So. And off you go to be an estate agent, a magazine publisher, a finance broker, and then, I mean, yeah. were you back? At all those things? No, I was, I was reasonable at all those things. <laughs> you know, like I was jack of all trades, yeah. you know, that, that thing. I, I could apply myself and get pretty good at something. Um, but I, um, I must have had an identity issues or something at the time because I was trying all these things. And then I was, I was at the cinema, which we all love, and, you know, and it's a special place for me, obviously, being an actor and a filmmaker. Yeah. And I remember thinking, you know, you watch um, someone flying a helicopter, you watch a, uh, a fireman or a soldier or someone, because they're all in he heroic roles. And I don't know if you did this, but you put yourself in the protagonist's... You try to, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you put him in his shoes. And I was thinking, well, I could do that. I could do this. I could do the other. And it struck me one day, they're all actors. So they're getting to do a little bit of everything, aren't they? They're getting to live out their fantasies and, you know, play out all these, these um, wonderful fantasies on screen. Um, so I started acting instead. But, you, but you've not been... You know, professionally trained. How no, do you? No, and no. you were what pushing forty at that moment, or I, I was literally forty when I started. Yeah. So how do you become an actor? Oh God, that was weird. Um, <laughs> I mean, clearly it's some kind of midlife crisis, you know. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a special spin on a midlife crisis, I think, because um, the Germans call it. I don't know if you know the word. It's called Torschlusspanik, which is because I always wanted to be an actor. So you did. Yeah, from the age of ten. All right. I lived next door to Pauline Quirk. OK, wow, yeah. yeah and yeah. She used to, just a quick backstory yeah. um, before we go back to the fun yeah. story. But you know, basically, she'd come out of Anna Schur and she'd want to continue uh, her training. So we were in a council state in Stamford Hill, a place called Gibson Gardens, and I was good friends with her brother, Sean. And she'd come in and she'd play all these crazy games with us on the street, cobbled street, chairs. So she, she then became the director of extracurricular drama <laughs> training. And I was about 10 years old and got the bug and uh, the feeling of it never left me. So I just suppressed it, tried to go out and make a few quid, mm. as you would, you know, mm. the, the tough acting's a tough game. Mm. And then as I was approaching 40, I got this thing that I just mentioned, which is, I've got to make sure I say it correctly, torche loose panique, which is doors closing behind mm. you. So you're running out of time mm. to do all those things that you are passionate about or that you have in your heart, your heart's yep. desire. So I just quit my job. My uh, business partner at the time thought I was absolutely nuts. <laughs> As you would. And I said, I'm going to go and do uh, stand-up comedy. So I did stand-up first, because uh, that's kind of more of a working-class art. So my family cringed less when I said, I'm going to go and do stand-up. I know it might be hard to understand, but we're very working-class. The yeah. art's not in our paradigm. Yeah, so I yeah. said, I'm going to go and do stand-up. So they were like, oh, OK, because it's quite brave, isn't it, stand-up? OK, you're going to go and try and be funny. That's all right. If I, if I had said, you know, or, you know, came in like I'm a tortured artist, they would have been like... Yeah. Shut up, you silly <laughs> sausage. You know, get, get, back, get back to doing whatever you do. So I did stand up, then moved yeah. into acting. And you got some great roles. I mean, how did you get in these films? How did you get in The Rise? How did you get in North v South? How did you get... I mean, how does it happen? Is it, is it networking? Is it, is it being pushy? It's a little bit of everything, you know. I, I think you, you... The first thing is you've got to really want it badly, you know, because mm. you, you've got to want it. I had to... The stand-up, and I did 25 short films... So that was like my drama school. So I learned on the job. Um, 
I, I would turn up in a short film, and I think there's a, there's a, a big um, short filmmaking community in London. They'd see me in something, realise I'm cheap, and then I'd get cast through six degrees of separation. So I did like 24 short films in a two-year period, and then did the stand-up at the same time, which is brutal. Mm. You know, stand-up is real turbo training in terms of your performance. Um, so I did the short films and the stand-up, and that really got me kind of ready for feature films. I also uh, was part of a production company that um, made films, so that gave me another little in and a bit of an angle, and that's how the Timothy Spall one came around. Yeah, I saw that. And then Gloves Off, of course, which you sort of helped write, and, 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 and very much one of your babies, um, with some great people you acted with at that, didn't you? Oh, that was, that's, Gloves Off was... It's still the six... Apart from my son being born, it's the best six weeks of my life, yeah. without a shadow of a doubt. Denise Van Outen, Ricky Tomlinson, Paul Barber from The Full Monty... And we just had so much fun. Ricky would just... I mean, have you met Ricky? I don't know. No, I haven't. Yeah, OK, so no. he's just like Tommy Cooper and Eric Morecambe. He's just got funny bones, you know. Um, you know, he is one of the funniest men I've ever met. And um, he, he would just continually and perpetually tell jokes. So everyone's morale's up and you're having a good time. But the actual film itself, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a brutal subject, Gloves Off, isn't it? Yeah, yeah um, well, it was comedy, um, but prize fighting's brutal. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so we try to get the balance of the comedy yeah. and the vice. So, so it wasn't, it wasn't glorification of it? It's just, not, no, not glorification of it, just trying to be a comedy drama, really, trying to yeah. keep it light. Like, uh, it was in the vein of the Full Monty. In fact, the Sun mm. uh, called it the Full Monty. So it's like yeah. that, brassed off. Yeah. Uh, East is East. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but with a bit of um, traveller high five. <laughs> I was going to say something quickly about Ricky as well, which is you have to avoid him if you've got some dramatic work to do. Right. So basically, because he makes fun all the time, if you've got to go and be emotional somewhere, I'd have to keep away from him for about four hours. Because he just have you giggling. We better get him on talking. We better get him on talking pints. Because I think he and I politically would disagree, but we'd probably do it in a nice way. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, he had a lot of trouble in the 70s, didn't he? Mm, I say I trouble, it was his cause. And yeah, no, 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 I know that. It's interesting, really, Brad, you start off in, star you know, in stand-up comedy and you clearly love humour and comedy still. Isn't life getting difficult for comedians in terms of what you can talk about, what you can joke about, safe spaces, cancel culture, people's gigs being stopped. I mean, it's getting harder, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm really surprised I'm still on. I thought I'd be cancelled already. <laughs> I was fully expecting a, a, a hook to take me off because I can easily say the wrong thing. Yeah. You know, as a comedian, you have to speak from the heart. And I, I get things wrong occasionally, um, with, even not... I don't do stand-up anymore, but just generally trying to be funny in life, you yeah. know, in the pub or whatever. And you might be slightly inappropriate or whatever, and, you, and in the old days you'd have said, oh, I'm sorry, that was a bit off. Yeah, you don't mean anything about yeah. it, there's no malice, but you're... Ba basically, when you make gags, you're taking a risk each time, aren't you? You're rolling a mm. dice on a gag. Mm. And, um, you know, I say to my son, I get the old tum tumbleweed that my son and all his mates don't laugh at, you know, and I'm sort of sitting there like, mm, please laugh. <laughs> but I say to him, you know, well, I've just made 18 good gags and you've got the one uh, mm. rubbish one. But, but you've got to take, take a risk, so... But where does, where does cancel culture take comedy? I just, or is there going to be a pendulum swing that re sort of reverses I, back? I was just thinking, I, I, wouldn't, I, I couldn't imagine being a comic right now these last three or four years. You know, they're going after Joe Rogan at the moment, if you see Yeah, that, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't think of a more balanced... Joe's very right in some ways, yes. very left in other ways. I, yeah. To me, uh, with the people that I watch on YouTube, he feels like he has kind of some balance. Quite an, He's clearly a nice guy underneath it all, but they're going after him. They're going after him. Oh, yeah, Big they're going after him. Well, he's too successful as well, isn't he? Oh, I think a £100 million quid deal is <laughs> one of the reasons why they're going after him, isn't it? But is he too big to be cancelled? Um, in the end... I think the tech giants are so big. They, yeah. I mean, they cancelled Donald Trump. So, then he's not too big to be cancelled. So he's not too big. No, he's not too big to be cancelled. But a thought on all of this, Brad, because, I mean, the one thing that I've noticed over the years is that the best stand-up comedians, the best humorists, are those who observe human nature, human mannerisms, but also they observe the world around them. They get the mood. Richard Pryor. You know, yeah. People like that. You I mean, know. Where, where do you feel we are as a country at the moment? Oh, God. I, I actually am feeling more and more like a fish out of water. Not just uh, it was Brexit four years ago, then, you know, these big media um, 
Roller, 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 roller coaster. What's wrong with Brexit? Wrong with Brexit. <laughs> you did a very good job. And your hair is so beautifully grey, I now know why Brexit happened. I saw some old ladies voting for it. You've got a really nice sheen in this light. It's clearly... Uh, the, the, your hair is the reason Brexit happened. But, yeah, no, I... Um, this roller coaster, Brexit, Covid, the war now... Yeah. I... I'm just feeling more and more like a fish out of water in this world. You know, I got a parking ticket at a petrol garage about a week ago. Petrol. You, I, I, I got the petrol, I had a coffee, I cleaned my car around the back because mm. I'm lazy, I don't do the mm. whole, you know, do-it-yourself thing. I just I like to stick a, stick a thing and then check out my social media, you know, and just sit back and watch the car get cleaned. And um, three days later, I got a parking ticket, or two days later, I got a parking ticket. What's that all about? It takes you three hours to get through to a bank mm. to talk about your account. Mm, yeah. It takes you three hours to get a utility bill paid. There's a bit of frustration in the country, isn't uh, there? I just don't... 20 years ago, I don't remember those all being... No, I know. Problems. No, I know. Well, look, I'll tell you what, Brad, what we need you to do is keep on producing entertaining content, funny content, because above all, what we need to do in any situation is to go on having a smile, isn't it? Ah, and that, that is crucial, because with the council culture and everything that is happening, will that, you know, are com comedians just getting more and more shut down? Um, and eventually, so terrified to say anything that nothing's funny anymore. Keep fighting and thank yeah, you for yeah, joining no, cheers, me on Talking Pines. Very, very good. I could keep talking all afternoon, couldn't yeah, I? Yeah, he really could. Yeah, yeah, cut, he really cut, cut on Brad. <laughs> cut on Brad. <laughs> Marco Longhi, the Conservative Member of Parliament for Dudley North, joins me. Welcome to the programme. Very, very nice good one. to see you. A 29 intake and somebody who'd done a lot of things before you know, getting into politics. You've done a lot of local politics, though, hadn't you? I mean, you were a black country man. Yes. As I understand, you've got the Black Country badge. Absolutely. On your, on Wherever your, I go. On your lapel. <laughs> um, but local politics was your way into this, being a councillor, working your way up. Um, it's funny, isn't it? We, under, we underplay the importance of local councillors and local politics. Uh, I think so. And I would be minded to think that actually if most MPs spent at least some time in local government before looking at national politics, they'd be cutting their teeth at the... At the coal face. That's what we would certainly say in the black country, at the coal yeah, face. Yeah. Because, um, because that's where they can probably most make that very real, tangible difference to, to people's lives. And it was probably one of the most satisfying times for me uh, when I entered politics at that, at that stage. And you had some family history in local politics. Oh, yes, yes. So my, my grandfather was a coal miner yeah. uh, in the black country, and I followed very much his lead. And he was like a second father to me in so many, so many different ways. He, both his parents were dead by the age of 10 or 11, and he was down the coal mines at the age of 14, pretending to be 18. Yeah. He went allowed, if not, and just as scratch a living. Hard days. And he, be he became the self-made man working really, really hard, and, and every moment uh, I could spend uh, with him, uh, I did, and I took a lot of my approach to life uh, from, from the values that he taught me. Heartland Labour, you know, since 1918, yeah. since the boys came back from the front, it's been Heartland Labour and the coal mining communities. Yeah. Um, when did it start going wrong for Labour in areas like Dudley? I think for many, many years, for, for decades, p people probably thought that their, when, it, when election time arrived, they did the thing that their fathers and their grandfathers always did, which was to vote a certain way. And, uh, and I think over time, people realised that actually they were being taken for granted. Yeah. If, at the crux of it all, people voted con you know, for Brexit and for the Conservative Party supporting Boris for many, many different reasons, whether it was illegal immigration, whether it was this, that, or the other. And actually, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, lots of Labour voters just couldn't support Jeremy Corbyn. Um, I actually think it's because Labour ignored them. Mm. I, that's how I would sum it up. Well, I saw and, uh, it. I saw it, um, Marco. You know, they voted UKIP in big numbers, yeah. they voted Brexit Party in big numbers, they voted... Yeah, Labour suddenly was a London party, it was disconnected. Yeah. I mean, it's Brexit that's really brought these people into the Conservative uh, fold, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes, I think it, it, it is. And uh, because Boris, um, as, as a politician in particular also, I think, he's able to sprinkle that little bit of gold dust. He has that thing that a lot of politicians don't have, which is mm. something special. I can't quantify it into words. So there were a lot of things that came together for people uh, being able to vote uh, Conservative at the last election. But it, it was... 
it was some, it's something visceral, you know, for, for, for people. I was knocking on doors in 2019, and people would literally drag me into their home saying, mm. Marco, mm. I'm going to do something I've never ever yeah, done before. Yeah, yeah. You need to just hold my hand and take me over the line. Will mm. you do this, 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 and this? Mm. You know, illegal immigration was one of the things. And, 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 and so this is why I'm hell-bent on making sure that we keep to those promises, because otherwise there's a very serious danger that no, we'll, well, we'll punished. We will come back to that. And I, it's interesting because, you know, you've had a successful career. Yeah. You've made some money, you've done well. Yeah. But I, I noticed one of the things on your CV was that you joined an oil and gas exploration <laughs> company. I mean, I'm, Absolutely. you can't be a great friend of Lord Goldsmith's or Carrie's oh, or anyone like that, I don't uh, suppose. Well. <laughs> I mean, you heard the debate, I think, that we were having earlier on tonight, yeah. you know, about Quadrilla. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is there a chance that the Prime Minister will change his mind on all of this? Because this increase in people's domestic bills actually is, is, is making us focus, isn't it, on the cost of some <clears> of those <throat> renewables? A absolutely. So, you know, we, we, we've had a war against COVID and we've, we, we've now got a war on, on very high energy prices, which actually means a war on poverty in so many ways. Mm. Uh, so to me, uh, I mean, as a conservative, as a free marketeer and as a, as, as a pragmatic libertarian, a lot of the things we did during COVID is something that uh, I, I never thought I would ever do. And I think that in wartime scenarios, what we actually need to do is become more pragmatic about our way forward. And what I really dislike about the eco-warrior dogmatic agenda is that... Do you, do you mean Boris's agenda? Uh, I, <laughs> I mean the Zach Goldsmith's agenda. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, Mr Johnson, your leader, said we should become the Saudi Arabia of wind. Um, I, look, you know... Uh, I want my children and my grandchildren and their children to live in a decarbonised economy and I think the move towards renewables is the right thing. But it's got to be done in a pragmatic, step-by-step -step way. Mm. That, that is what I would say. And I think most people would probably agree with that common sense approach. And it's about common sense. It's when you have that binary conversation that if you suddenly start saying that actually we need to be looking at our energy mix that for uh, risk reasons, for strategic reasons, must include some fossil fuel, i.e. gas and oil, that all of a sudden you're branded as a horrible person oh, yeah. who, who oh, yeah. is against climate, you know, climate oh, yeah. change yeah. denier and all of that yeah, kind yeah. of thing, is ridiculous. You know, and I can easily see how the Zach Goldsmiths would probably uh, label me that way, but I'm not. I just think we need the right energy misc, mix, the yep. right strategy. And if you look at what... Oliver Dowden has said, and you might have seen Zach Small, Goldsmith and Oliver Dowden uh, being a little unhappy with each other. Yeah. And the last couple of Prime Minister's questions where the conversation and the tone towards fossil fuels mm. has changed. So I'm very happy with that. No. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking bright for many, with the majority of the showers fading away. Let's take a look at the details. Zooming into the southwest of England, and it will be a fine end to the day here with plenty of sunshine. It will quickly begin to feel chilly, though, once the sun begins to set. Moving eastwards, and there could be one or two showers around first thing this evening, but these will quickly ease away, leaving clear skies. Across then into Wales and any showers will fade away with most of the cloud also melting away, leaving a clear but chilly evening. Any showers across the Midlands will tend to become confined to northern and eastern parts with skies largely clear elsewhere. Once the sun sets, skies will clear further, giving a cold night for all. After an afternoon of sunshine and showers, northern England will see a dry evening with skies turning increasingly clear. Just like elsewhere, it will be a chilly end to the day with a frost forming. Moving into Scotland and the showers will continue across some northern and eastern areas with these wintry across the higher ground. Elsewhere, there will be some late sunshine to end the day. And Northern Ireland will also see some late sunshine and apart from the Odd, very isolated shower, it will be a dry end to the day for most. Overnight, most will be dry and clear, leading to a cold night with widespread frost developing, especially in the countryside. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight and into tomorrow morning. 
Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering as their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets, and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss, and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already, a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children, and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighboring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families.